evening. I am Brooke Clement, and it is my pleasure as director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum to welcome you to this evening's talk with Ian Toll, commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. At this time, I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor the more than 2,400 sailors, soldiers, and civilians who lost their lives 80 years ago today. Thank you. Before I introduce our speaker, I am happy to announce that the museum in Grand Rapids is finally open for visitors. The Gerald R. Ford Presidential Express is currently on display through early January. This train exhibit is a delight for children of all ages. Each year, the exhibit evolves to include more displays from the life of President Ford. COVID precautions are in place, so please visit our website for ticketing details and restrictions. In theme with tonight's lecture, I'd also like to announce our next fe feature exhibit. On January 24th, 2022, visitors to the museum can view the temporary display, Women in Uniform. This is an exhibition of rarely displayed art from the Naval History and Heritage Command's collection depicting female Navy military personnel. The exhibit will run until May. Now on to tonight's program. I would like to thank the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and Grand Valley's Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies for support of tonight's event. The Library and Museum's Deputy Director, Joel Westfall, will be incorporating your questions into the Q&A portion of tonight's lecture. You can submit your questions anytime during the program using the chat feature. Ian W. Toll is a writer and military scholar. He is the author of four highly regarded works of American military history, Six Frigates, Pacific Crucible, The Conquering Tide, and Twilight of the Gods. The latter three titles are a nonfiction trilogy about the Pacific War. Pacific Crucible received the Northern California Book Award for nonfiction in 2012. The Conquering Tide was a New York Times bestseller and was named the best book of 2016 by the editor of the Financial Times. In 2019, Ian received the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award for the US, from the USS Constitution Museum. Ian has been widely published in newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Boston Globe. He has been a regular reviewer for the New York Times Review of Books. His books on the Pacific War have been translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Dutch. He has spoken at venues and institutions throughout the United States, including the Pentagon, the U.S. Treasury Department, the National World War II Museum, and the U.S. Naval Academy. Please join me in welcoming Ian to our virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Uh, I, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. I'm, uh, I, regretted that uh, we were unable to do this in person. I do look forward to visiting Michigan at some point in the future, but I'm glad that we have this option. Uh, I it <clears throat> launched uh, the third book in my trilogy last September 2020, and uh, that was a time when we really couldn't get out and do anything. Uh, the vaccines had not yet become available, and so I did, um, I think, 36 events uh, over Zoom and uh, did not do a single in-person event until the spring of uh, this, this, this year. Um, so we've all gotten good at this. Um, today marks the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it, it's extraordinary really because for the uh, 13, 14 years that I've been fully engaged in researching and writing about the Pacific War, uh, I had the opportunity, the privilege, the honor of speaking to dozens of uh, direct eyewitnesses to that attack. Uh, and <clears throat> it's simply in the nature of, of things, of the cycle of life, that uh, most of those eyewitnesses today have passed. Uh, and of course, there are a few who remain. Um, 80 years is a long time. Uh, in 1941, when this attack uh, descended on Pearl Harbor. It had been 80 years since the first year of the Civil War uh, for comparison purposes. 
uh, the first year of the Civil War. It had been 80 years since the Battle of Yorktown, which decided the American Revolution. Um, a great deal, of course, has been written about the attack on Pearl Harbor. It is, uh, one might argue, the single most important event of the 20th century, not just in American history, but in the history of the world. Because it brought this country into that war uh, in a way <clears throat> in, in which we were uh, united and determined to win it, which of course we did, and that shaped uh, really the entire course of, of subsequent events uh, in the 20th century and through today. In a literal sense, we know more about Pearl Harbor now than those who lived through it did then. And this is one of the paradoxes of being a historian is that uh, you can be uh, born 25 years after an event. I was born in 1967. And yet because uh, with the march of time, uh, with the accumulation of historical knowledge analysis, uh, with the recording of the oral histories, the writing of the memoirs, uh, the release of um, uh, documents that uh, would have been classified, uh, over time you gain a greater picture in retrospect uh, of an event like this. And so when I read about the attack on Pearl, this is true really of, of all of the events of the Pacific War. Uh, whenever, whenever I'm researching or writing about this subject, I have this odd feeling that I know more than, than even the commanders who are making the decisions uh, in the moment. And in a sense, I do. But of course, by uh, accumulating all of that knowledge, by gaining that much deeper, richer understanding of historical events, which is the work of historians, uh, we, in a way, uh, um, uh, start to lose touch with those who, who live through an event in the moment and then experience the, the searing horror of it. And this is particularly true, I think, when we come to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Of course, it was a surprise attack. Uh, it came as uh, such a shock to, to those who were there uh, in Pearl Harbor on, the, on those ships when those uh, Japanese planes suddenly descended out of a clear blue sky on Sunday morning, uh, that uh, many of them uh, would say, and this is something I heard over and over again, there's really just no way for me to explain what it was like. Uh, on the other hand, if, uh, if there was another eyewitness there sitting in the room, uh, those two eyewitnesses would be able to look at each other and say, there's no need for us to, to talk about it because we were, we shared, we shared that feeling. Um, you know, the oral histories are collected and archived. We now understand every stage of Japan's uh, planning and execution of the raid. Uh, it's all been convincingly documented. Scholars on both sides of the Pacific broadly agree on the strategic, tactical, and political significance of the attack. But of course, in absorbing all this research and perspective, um, our, our ability to empathize with the direct feelings of those who looked up with their unbelieving eyes and saw those Japanese planes uh, uh, suddenly descend uh, at a time when we were not at war. Japan strike on Pearl Harbor was in tactical and strategic terms, a brilliant success. Uh, the Japanese carrier uh, air, airplanes succeeded in knocking all eight battleships of our Pacific fleet out of action, really just in the first 15 minutes of the Pacific War. Uh, none of the ships in the Japanese task force was so much as scratched. Uh, and the Japanese lost uh, less than 30 planes in the attack. The uh, sudden loss of our entire battle line uh, really forced our Navy to let go of certain traditional ideas, uh, of certain uh, naval doctrines and dogmas. It forced the service to innovate on the fly, to develop and refine new technologies and weaponry, uh, to uh, bring aviation, uh, carrier warfare, submarine warfare, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to turn them into really the centerpiece of how we were going to begin to fight this war at sea, uh, to develop and to refine new technologies, uh, uh, radar, radio intelligence, and to begin to face up to the stupendous 
logistical and supply problems involved in fighting a war across the interminable distances of the Pacific. Uh, the success of the attack on Pearl Harbor was also uh, a, a sudden and very rude awakening in the sense that we had uh, many of us uh, Americans ins insisted on holding the Japanese in contempt prior to the beginning of the war. With timing that really could not have been worse, uh, Navy Secretary Frank Knox had launched a media offensive really just a, in the week prior to the attack uh, in which his objective was to reassure the American people uh, that the Navy had nothing to fear uh, from the Japanese. In a Collier's Magazine interview, which was a cover story on the cover of the magazine, uh, this was, I think, the third most widely circulated magazine in the country, uh, the uh, uh, article that um, uh, the uh, title of the article uh, on uh, the Collier's uh, interview with Frank Knox was, The Navy is Ready. And in that interview, Knox had predicted that the US Navy would knock Japan out of the water in six weeks. Uh, before the war, uh, we and our allies, the British, had taken comfort in a, a conviction that the, J the Japanese air power was simply not to be taken seriously. Uh, we knew very little about uh, Japanese military airplanes. Uh, and yet, even with that lack, lack of knowledge, uh, we took comfort in this idea that their air forces amounted to a few obsolete uh, cast off European planes uh, and designs that had been copied from obsolete uh, European or American planes. Uh, and that uh, uh, Japanese pilots were inherently uh, of, of very low skill, low talent. And that impression had been nourished by quackish pseudoscientific theories proposed by so-called experts of various fields. Uh, it was said that the Japanese would always make bungling pilots uh, because they suffered from innate physiological defects. Uh, we had doctors uh, explaining that uh, racially, I'm saying, uh, they were innately cross-eyed and nearsighted, that that could be a symptom of their slanted eyes. Uh, it was said that as infants, infants, they had been carried on the backs of their mothers, causing their heads to wobble in a way that threw off the balance in their inner ears. And Western Aviation Journal cited statistics of dubious origin uh, which purported to, to show that Japan had the highest aviation crash rate uh, in the world. And it was really only after the shocking losses of December 1941 uh, that it began to dawn on the Allies that they had seen only what the Japanese had wanted them to see and that the Japanese had very deliberately and very effectively concealed the full capabilities uh, of, their, of their air forces and in particular of their uh, carrier air forces, their mobile carrier air forces. Uh, the um, stunning uh, attack on Pearl Harbor was followed just hours later with uh, an aerial blitzkrieg across the Western Pacific. And the results were similar. Uh, even with about nine hours of notice, our air forces in the Pacific uh, were caught mostly on the ground. And uh, half of uh, the uh, fighters and bombers in General MacArthur's uh, Air Force in the Philippines was destroyed on that first day of the war. Uh, the RAF over Malaya uh, was wiped out within about two weeks. Uh, on the third day of the war, the Japanese uh, uh, Air Forces attacked and destroyed two British battleships uh, operating off the coast of Malaya in full combat readiness. And that was the first time in history that that had been done, that battleships had been destroyed while operating at sea uh, in full combat readiness uh, by an attack from the air. Um, <clears throat> President Gerald Ford, of course, was uh, a committed member of the isolationist movement, uh, as were many others in his generation uh, prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, the, uh, sudden, the sudden attack uh, and the success, the shocking success of that attack really forced that entire generation to very quickly reassess. And of course, as every American school child knows, uh, the attack on Pearl galvanized this nation. Uh, the uh, America First movement, the isolationist movement collapsed literally overnight uh, because on December 8th, uh, FDR asked the US Congress for a declaration of war against Japan. And that declaration of war 
uh, was unanimous in the Senate and there was one dissenting vote in the House. Uh, so uh, very quickly after December 7th, uh, we and our British allies uh, had to accept that our assumptions had been spectacularly wrong and that we had invited uh, our disastrous defeats uh, at Pearl Harbor and in the Philippines and in, throughout the Western Pacific uh, by our own hubris. Uh, we had to swallow a bitter pill. We had to accept the hard truth uh, that the Japanese Navy was just better. Uh, it was better than the US Navy at the outset of the war. Alvin Kernan, who was an ordinanceman on the Enterprise, later a professor at Princeton, uh, wrote an excellent memoir of his experiences in the war. He said that six weeks after Pearl Harbor, he and his shipmates had come around to understand that, and this is his quote, theirs was a better Navy than ours, better aircraft, better trained personnel, better night training, better tor torpedoes by far. And it was fortunate uh, that as a nation, we were able to let go of that pre-war hubris, our tendency to take the Japanese for granted because it left really everyone involved in the effort, uh, military servicemen of all the branches of the military and really civilians on the home front as well with the bracing realization that everyone was gonna have to do their part uh, to, uh, to meet this challenge uh, and to win this, this terrible war uh, that we were gonna have to fight. By April 1942, just four months into the war, uh, Japan had uh, followed up on, on those initial uh, strategic victories uh, by conquering one of the greatest empires that had ever been brought under one flag. The vast perimeter of the Japanese empire stretched from the Kurile Islands in the north to Timor in the south, from the Gilbert Islands uh, in the Central Pacific to the frontiers of India in the west. Uh, and there were pockets of allied resistance remaining, notably on Bataan and Corregidor in the Philippines, but they could not hold out much longer. Uh, Japan, a nation uh, now as then, uh, impoverished in natural resources, had secured bountiful sources of oil, rubber, tin, uh, and other uh, important minerals, and they could feed these vital inputs into their war machine. Uh, and most extraordinarily, this new empire had been won at negligible cost. Casualties had run to only about uh, 10,000 men at that point. Total merchant shipping losses had amounted to 25,000 tons and the Imperial Japanese Navy, Navy had lost uh, nothing larger than a destroyer. That was the enemy and the challenge uh, faced uh, by uh, the allies uh, in the Pacific. My uh, trilogy, which I completed last year, uh, tells the entire story of, of how we turn the situation around over three volumes. And I don't have time to go uh, into the whole story today. I also want to leave uh, plenty of opportunity for discussion uh, um, to follow and for, for uh, Q&A. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll just say that the Pacific War uh, was by a vast margin the largest uh, naval war ever waged in history. It was the only naval war that has ever been waged across the entire length and breadth of the Pacific Ocean, an ocean so large that you could fit all of the world's combined land masses into it with room to spare. It was the only instance in which opposing fleets of aircraft carriers met in battle. There were five such battles in the war. It provided the most complete demonstration in history of the means by which submarines could destroy uh, enemy supply lines and destroy a combatant's ability to wage war by essentially strangling its economy. It led to a fundamental rev revolution in uh, naval and air doctrines. It put an end to the era of big gun battleships, it established carrier aviation and submarines as the principal means of waging war at sea. And of course, it introduced strategic bombing on a massive scale. Uh, and, uh, and through the new instrument of the B-29, uh, a heavy, very long range bomber that was able to reach out and strike Japan across uh, some a radius of 1500 miles. Uh, there have been uh, persistent biases in the World War II literature. Of course, World War II uh, is a, a subject we would say that literature is mature. A lot has been written about it. A lot of historians have had their say. Uh, in some cases, too much has been published. 
uh, and books have been, become repetitive. Um, but uh, I, when I look at World War II, I think there are these two persistent biases which have uh, uh, worked together to kind of limit our understanding of what happened in the Pacific in particular. One is our preference uh, for understanding a war as war on land in which naval operations war at sea uh, play a supporting role. That often is the case. It certainly was the case in Europe uh, during the Second World War. And as a continental people, people living on this enormous continent of North America, uh, it doesn't come as naturally to us to think about naval war as uh, the principle, the most important uh, uh, aspect of war. And yet when you come to the Pacific, I think you have to invert that understanding. You have to think of it as a naval war, first of all, also an air war, in which uh, fighting on land played a supporting, supporting role. It was a supporting operation in the way that naval operations were uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, I think you can measure it in the immense popular celebrity of the major American generals of World War II, Marshall, Eisenhower, MacArthur, Patton, in contrast to the relative anonymity of the war's leading admirals, King, Nimitz, Halsey, Spruance. Uh, I think you see it in the somewhat scant attention paid to the Pacific Naval War, in particular in films, television programs, documentaries, other forms of popular entertainment. Um, I think that there had been a lack of outstanding films. Uh, major motion pictures depicting the uh, Pacific War. And those uh, films that we have had tended to depict the fighting on islands rather than uh, on what happened uh, at sea. And indeed, I think it may be said that for many Americans, even those familiar with the history of the Second World War more broadly, uh, the Pacific uh, campaign began with this attack on Pearl Harbor, continued with a trans-Pacific campaign of bloody island fighting, and then ended at Hiroshima. But really just a glance of, the, of a map of the Pacific uh, will help you to grasp that the war against Japan was a sea war and the destruction of the Japanese Navy was the paramount factor leading to victory. And the Marines might seize remote Pacific islands in savage and valorous combat as they often did, uh, but they only could do that after being delivered safely to the beaches and supported uh, by heavy ship to shore bombardment and by the tremendous logistics effort it took to maintain seaborne supply lines. And conquering islands was never a goal in itself. When an island served uh, no purpose, uh, it was simply bypassed and its occupiers left to wither on the vine, uh, as, which was the term of art. An island was seized only when it was needed as a new sea or air base uh, with an airstrip carved out of the jungle and a harbor blasted out of the coral to allow the fleet and the bombers to consolidate their westward advance against the, across the Pacific. Um, and I'll finish with this one thought. Uh, I'm often asked why a military history, why write about war? What, what's this fascination with war? And I, I've thought deeply about this and, and this is the way I think about it. War is a force that has shaped our history, all history. It is a test uh, of nations, of uh, systems of government, of peoples, and of inf inf uh, individuals. Uh, uh, and the attack on Pearl Harbor placed uh, this country under great stress. And uh, just as an engineer will stress test a product, uh, engineers stress test things, software, uh, uh, metal alloys, uh, bridges, uh, stress testing uh, is done for the purpose of obtaining information about the thing you're testing that you could not obtain otherwise. A war is like a stress test in history. And uh, studying uh, governments, um, societies, individuals, systems uh, under that stress of war gives you information about those underlying uh, uh, systems that you would not obtain by uh, looking at them in peacetime. That I think is the best, the strongest argument uh, for a focus on military history and the history of, of war. So with that, I will pause. I, I believe I'm gonna be joined uh, by Joel now and we're going to uh, continue our discussion. Ian, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thank you for uh, doing this and thank you for helping us uh, commemorate the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Um, let's dive into some of the questions I have prepared for you. Uh, so before we get into questions about the military aspects of the fateful day, let us discuss Pearl Harbor as it relates to collective memory. 
But Pearl Harbor, I would argue, was the very first collective memory event of our nation. And what I mean by this is that nearly every single American who was alive on December 7th can recall in high detail, vivid memories of what exactly they were doing on that day, even decades and decades later. This is very similar to other historical events, such as the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. What does Pearl Harbor mean 80 years later, and why do we still remember and commemorate? Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, and I, and I think it's those three events that are unique in that way. Uh, if you try to think of a fourth event that has that characteristic uh, when everybody can remember exactly where they were, or what they were doing when they heard the news. It's, it's really those three events, 1941, 1963, and 2001. Um, you know, it, it was, of course, the uh, event that, um, that once and for all settled this, this argument uh, that we had been having as a nation about uh, whether we need to engage deeply with the rest of the world. Uh, or whether we uh, were protected by these oceans on both sides, these, uh, these colossal moats, and that we could withdraw uh, from the world and, um, and use, use the, the distance, the isolation, and uh, our ability to defend our hemisphere as our, our national security plan. Of course, that was what the uh, isolationists uh, wanted to do. And um, in this, this very sudden, very, very brutal, uh, and as we saw it, a very dishonorable uh, surprise attack, uh, which was obviously planned and executed under cover of ongoing diplomatic talks, uh, I think just enraged the country in a way uh, that um, left no doubt at all uh, that uh, we were going to do what, whatever was necessary uh, in order to be sure that we could not be attacked in that way again. And so, uh, I, you know, I think we're we're maybe going to get a little bit into the the politics, but I, I um, you know, we 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 can look at Pearl Harbor as a military event, uh, but perhaps a more important uh, way of looking at it was that it was a an event that recast our politics uh, in the most dramatic, uh, most complete way imaginable, uh, and uh, and it it solved FDR's a great problem, which was that. He, by the fall of 1941, saw that it was going to be necessary for this country to, to get into the war, uh, that that was going to be inevitable, that it was going to happen sooner or later. And yet, um, in our system, uh, the president can't, can't just simply decide we're going to war. Uh, he's got to have a vote in Congress. And I think more broadly, he's got to have the support of the American people uh, behind him. The attack on Pearl Harbor, because of the way it was carried out, uh, instantaneously solved uh, the, that uh, dilemma for FDR. So another aspect of Pearl Harbor is, of course, as you mentioned, you know how the nation came together with this crisis. Um, it essentially ended the American First Movement as men like President Ford rushed to enlist. Uh, describe the direct aftermath of those first 30 days following the Pearl Harbor attack. What were they like to the average American who, for the previous decades, were pretty much used to isolationism? Yeah, yeah, and I and I, to me, that was really one of the most fascinating aspects of the, in particular, the attack on Pearl Harbor was what was the mood of the country immediately afterwards, uh, and what you find when you when you read the old newspapers uh, about uh, the events that are happening just in a week after Pearl Harbor. Uh, is it is it a kind of um, uh, a, a, a low level hysteria virtu virtually? Uh, for example, it was reported uh, in San Francisco and in LA uh, on December eighth that Japanese airplanes had attacked both of those cities. Uh, and uh, uh, this this wasn't speculation; it was reported as fact in these papers local military air commanders uh, endorsed these reports and said this was factually accurate uh, that the Japanese had attacked uh, the West Coast. On that day, December 8th, uh, you had air raid sirens uh, in, and alerts in cities along the East Coast. And you had, again, uh, factual reporting or, or assertions of fact 
that German planes uh, were attacking those cities in the east. And so there was a real sense that, um, that the attack on Pearl was, was simply the first uh, event in a sequence of events that was going to follow very, very quickly. Uh, and that, um, uh, that the United States may even be on the verge of, of being invaded. And so there was a good deal of fear uh, and hysteria in those, in those early days, uh, of course. And, um, and I think it took uh, some time uh, for the mood of the American people to, to shift somewhat, uh, to understand that this was actually going to be a long process, that uh, our hemisphere probably would not be directly threatened because of the distances involved, uh, but that we were going to have to gather our strength uh, to actually project our military force across great distances to get at our enemies. And, Europe and, uh, and on the other side of the Pacific. So the very first, many, many people know that I was the archivist to the, unit, uh, archivist to the United States Navy for a while. Uh, but before that, I was a regular archivist uh, working in Washington, DC for the Department of the Navy. And uh, the very, very first uh, collection I ever got to actually work on and complete was the Walter Lord collection at the Naval History and Heritage Command in, in DC, uh, his Day of Infamy book. Uh, it's considered a classic. Uh, but what I found interesting about that 1957 book was how much was missing from it. Mm. What do we now know 50 plus years later about that day that Walter Lord did not know? Yeah, well, um, you know, I would say it, it would fall into, you know, two, two big categories. One was, um, you know, what precisely uh, were, was the, the state of um, our intelligence about Japanese activities uh, leading up to the attack. Of course, there had been a, a series of um, uh, reviews uh, of um, investigations uh, carried out by the military, by the Congress, uh, some of those actually during the war itself, others shortly after the war. Uh, Walter Lord and other uh, authors uh, had access to all of that material, and yet there is a great deal more that has come to light about exactly what it was we knew, because some of those things uh, remained classified in the 50s. Uh, and so I think we have a, a deeper picture of you know, what it was uh, essentially that we knew, and I think it's fair to say that we knew uh, that uh, the Japanese were likely to launch a war against us. Uh, what we did not know was that they were going to attack us at Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and so that was the surprise, really, was that they hit us at Pearl. Uh, and then the second category is really uh, the Japanese side of the story. And I think we understand that much better now uh, than we did in the 1950s, uh, partly just because more of the Japanese participants, uh, little by little as they grew older, uh, were more willing to uh, discuss the events that they had seen uh, to Japanese writers and scholars and historians. Um, and uh, and what, what has become clear in, over time was that the Japanese decision to attack uh, us in the Pacific was one that was made under great stress and in a chaotic situation, really, in, in um, Tokyo, one in which, which was volatile, in which uh, it even seemed like there might be a breakdown in basic order. There could be coup d'etats, assassinations, uh, even civil war. Uh, and that uh, the decision to go forward with this attack was one that was made in this, this context in which the, among that tiny circle of uh, decision makers, of rulers at the top of the Japanese regime, uh, felt as if uh, they, they might even be in direct danger from uh, insurgents within the army in particular. And um, the commander in chief of the Japanese fleet, Isoroku Iso Yamamoto, uh, really had been strongly against the decision to go to war with the United States uh, and had counseled his government against it. Once it became clear that the decision was going to be to go forward uh, and to launch this war, he then insisted upon uh, being permitted to launch the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, it really had been his baby, his uh, brainchild, uh, his staff officers uh, underneath him had developed the, the plan, and, uh, and he insisted on, on um, uh, going forward with what 
seemed a very risky attack over the opposition of uh, officers in on the Naval General Staff, his superior officers in Tokyo. And so all of that, I think, is much better understood than it was uh, at the time when uh, Lord wrote his classic. So how instrumental was the Battle of Taranto to the Japanese in developing the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yeah, so Taranto, uh, as I'm sure many of the um, uh, many, many in the audience will know, was a British operation in the Mediterranean in which they sent uh, torpedo bombers, carrier bombers, uh, into the port of Taranto to attack uh, Italian warships and, um, and achieved a significant success there. And that had never been done before. And so, uh, yeah, the Japanese were aware of that attack. Uh, and, um, and I think it was, it, it contributed to that initial idea that they had uh, that they might be able to, to go in there uh, with torpedoes and dive bombers and level bombers and to launch a surprise attack against uh, the US Navy while it was in its stronghold, uh, not ready for war at anchor, un unable to get underway and maneuver. Uh, and so, yes, I mean, it, clearly in the record, uh, the uh, Yamamoto and, and his staff officers are discussing this example of, of Taranto, and that is uh, one of the events that undoubtedly got them interested initially in this, uh, in this concept. So we all know that, uh, that there were two waves of uh, bombers and torpedo planes that uh, attacked and hit Pearl Harbor. Yeah. But what a lot of folks don't know is that there was a third wave that was supposed to have been uh, taken, uh, taken off, but it didn't um, because the commander of the fleet, Nagumo, canceled it. Why, how, was it, how important was it that that third wave was, was called off by Nagumo? Yeah, well, there, I mean, there has been a fair amount of mythology around this third wave. Um, it is true that they had uh, discussed the possibility of a third wave and that that was a, uh, an option uh, that Nagumo had as a commander. Um, I don't think it was the case that he canceled it so much as um, perhaps it'd be more accurate to say that he did not exercise his option uh, to launch the third attack. Um, and um, uh, well, I mean, they, they could have uh, piled on more damage than they already did. I mean, they had uh, already done a, a good deal of damage. I think the, the bigger issue, rather than the third wave or, or not the third wave, was did the Japanese, um, uh, uh, were they wise in their target selection for this attack? And it's often been uh, observed uh, that they might profitably have spread uh, some of those uh, bombing targets to, to hit uh, uh, the fuel supply, uh, certain installations in the Navy Yard, uh, the submarine base, where there were, I believe, something like 25 submarines uh, sitting there at the finger piers, and submarines are very vulnerable uh, to aerial bombing. Uh, none were hit as it happened. Uh, there were other ships, there were cruisers, uh, there were uh, many ships that were not hit, and um, and, and uh, there were many additional bombs dropped on, on ships, the battleships in particular, that had already been hit. So there was a, uh, a lack of balance in the attack. Now, all of that is, you know, tactically, the Japanese could have scored an even bigger victory than they did, no question. Uh, they were very concerned about aerial counterstrikes on their fleet. In fact, we really did not have any real capability to launch an effective aerial counterstrike against their fleet. And so, uh, yeah, sticking around and uh, piling on uh, more bombs, more torpedoes onto the targets they'd already hit, in retrospect, would have been wise from their point of view. So um, a question, I noticed a question come up uh, while, uh, while you were talking, and I'm, I had this question prepared, uh, so I'm going to ask that. Uh, and that is the carrier situation. So was it a fluke of history? Um, just plain dumb luck that the aircraft carriers were not in port that day. Yes. Uh, the Enterprise and the Lexington had been dispatched to deliver uh, aircraft uh, to some of our smaller islands uh, farther to the west, Wake Island and uh, Johns Johnson, I believe. Uh, and so they were on this mission to deliver these aircraft. 
uh, and as a result, they were not important. Uh, the Japanese uh, had intended to strike those carriers. They, they had some idea of what ships were in port and what the, what the uh, patterns were because they had a spy in the uh, Japanese consulate uh, who, and because of the way anybody who's visited Pearl Harbor will, will, will notice that it's the way Oahu is laid out, it's impossible to conceal what ships are in the harbor because you can see the harbor from uh, so many different vantage points and high terrain all around the island. So they did uh, expect that uh, those two carriers uh, would be in port, the Enterprise, the Lexington, uh, they were not. And, um, and that was important, I think, because if those two carriers had been there, there's a good possibility that they would have been destroyed. Carriers are very vulnerable to aerial bombing, much more so than battleships. They're large targets. Uh, and if we had lost those two carriers um, at the outset of the war, we would not have been able to begin to fight an aggressive kind of uh, series of, of hit and run carrier raids in the, in the first six months of the war as we did. We probably would not have launched the Doolittle Raid, uh, which was the attack on Japan and uh, sort of a, 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 an attack by uh, Army B-25 bombers that were launched from a carrier deck. Uh, we probably would not have gone forward with that attack. Uh, then the Japanese may not have launched the Midway operation. So you can play out all of those counterfactuals. Uh, and of course, counterfactuals are difficult because they do involve a certain amount of speculation. But the fact that those carriers were not import uh, by a fluke, really, uh, was, I, I think, uh, a very useful uh, to the, to the uh, Americans because it allowed us to, to kind of get, get, the, get the war, get the show on the road earlier. Uh, with a series of these rather small pinprick carrier strikes, which uh, were important because they really shaped the way the Japanese uh, approached the war in that first critical year of the Pacific War. So as you mentioned, you've written a, a trilogy uh, of the entire Pacific War. When you look at Pearl Harbor, um, what do you think it meant in the kind of grand strategic outline from 41 to 45? What was its influence strategically? And then what was its influence on the men and women who fought in the war? You know, the, the argument for Pearl Harbor as perhaps the central event of the 20th century, you know, really has to do with this, with this observation that it brought the United States into the war. Uh, and in so doing, essentially sealed the fate, not only of Japan, but also of Germany. Uh, Prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, it appeared that uh, Hitler had already launched his Operation Barbarossa as Nazi Germany was invading the Soviet Union. It appeared uh, in November, early December 1941, that the Nazis were likely to take Moscow. It, um, it, it you know, very well, at least in, in the way that uh, the world perceived it, uh, Hitler might very well knock uh, the Soviets out of the war or forced them to, uh, to, to surrender, to agree to some sort of truce, in which case Nazi war machine then would be redirected again against Britain. <clears throat> All of this might have happened uh, if the Japanese had not struck us uh, at Pearl and brought us into the war. Uh, and so uh, it certainly was immensely important. It was important um, in that it, uh, uh, it allowed FDR essentially to do what he already wanted to do, uh, which was to mobilize, not just to, not just to declare war against the Axis powers, but to mobilize the American economy entirely, to reorganize it entirely, uh, to fight this catastrophic global war and win it. Uh, and, um, and the attack on Pearl, not just the fact that the Japanese attacked us, but the manner in which that was done the, the manner in which it enraged and unified the American people, uh, that uh, was uh, historically important. So uh, you kind of hit on this a little bit earlier. So there is a belief among World War II historians, I'm one of them, um, that the war began and ended on December 7th, that in effect, the eventual outcome was predetermined. Uh, and even mem uh, members of the Japanese high command, which you had mentioned earlier, uh, 
were extremely doubtful of success. Right. And yet they chose to go ahead anyways. Why? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's actually one of the most difficult questions to answer. Why did the Japanese attack us at Pearl Harbor? Why did they attack us at all? Why did they go to war against us? Uh, when it is clear from the record that so many of the leading figures uh, in the Japanese military who really had control of the country at that point, uh, at the time, uh, believed that their chances of victory were very slim. Uh, and some of those who acquiesced in the decision uh, to go to war and to attack us at Pearl uh, actually predicted at the time that this was going to lead to defeat, and yet they went ahead with it anyway. Uh, you know, there are different ways to go, go about this. I, I think it's important to understand that uh, Japan was, was just an absolute cauldron at that point. It was a powder keg. Uh, it was a nation, a fractious nation, in which uh, you had um, uh, factions within both branches of the military, the army and the navy, uh, that were pursuing their own lines of action, uh, that were willing to struggle, that were willing uh, even to depose, even to assassinate uh, their own leaders in order to get their way. The entire history of the 30s in Japan had just been a series of military uh, insurrections, assassin, targeted assassinations. Uh, and it seemed uh, to that circle of leaders at the top of that regime that if they did not go forward uh, with this decision to attack uh, the United States and Britain and to seize the oil fields uh, in Borneo and Sumatra, which is today Indonesia, uh, that uh, perhaps there'd be just a complete breakdown uh, in order, there would be insurgencies, uh, insurrections, uh, civil wars, perhaps even the Emperor Hirohito could be targeted. They were very concerned about all of that. And so uh, I, I think you could say that the decision to attack us was one that was made in desperation uh, and that was made uh, in order to prevent uh, a still worse calamity, at least in their point of view. Uh, and. Um, and there was a, a lot of hope. There was a, a lot of, they did a sort of wing in a prayer. Uh, and, um, and yet, it, as you say, they did foresee uh, the United States is a, a much larger nation. Uh, our economy was about 10 times larger than theirs. In many ways, we were more advanced despite the great capabilities of their military in, in the early part of the war. Uh, our scientific, uh, industrial, technological, uh, resources were much, much greater than theirs, and they knew that. Uh, and so I, I do tend to take more of what we call the determinist view, as you do, that um, in a sense, uh, Japan lost this war on December 7th, 1941. Now you mentioned something earlier, which uh, which I've, I've been thinking about while, while we were ha having this discussion, um, and that is the uh, your views on the, um, um, how the Japanese were able to kind of essentially fool us into believing that they were kind of less than. And I'm gonna throw out a word that is, uh, that's not really well known. Um, it's a Russian word. Um, it's called, uh, the word is maskirovka. Um, so I'm curious how, uh, after, for example, the Battle of Toshima Straits and the great victory, the great, great Japanese victory over, over um, um, Russia in 1905, how we were able to continue that kind of misguided view that the Japanese Navy was simply not up to par. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a good point. And at, at the time, there were, you know, at the time of the Russo-Japanese War, this is 1904, 1905, Theodore Roosevelt was the president. Uh, he uh, hosted the, uh, the truce talks in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, that led to the end of that war, to the treaty ending that war, won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, as a result of that. Uh, but he was among those who was early in warning uh, that the Japanese are, have uh, capabilities that are unlike those of any other non-Western nation. And that uh, despite the fact that they had very quickly kind of pulled themselves up from pre-industrial, feudal, isolated, feudal type of society, uh, 
uh, that they were going to continue uh, advancing at a rather extraordinary rate, uh, and that uh, we should never, never take for granted uh, that uh, we would be able to uh, defeat them even in a highly technologically advanced type of warfare like naval warfare or aerial warfare. Uh, so there were those uh, early who, who were making those predictions, and, and yet, you know, it's, it's a shame that, uh, that, they, that uh, we didn't have more foresight in that respect. Yeah. It's also true that uh, the Japanese did do a very good job of concealing the full capabilities, particularly their air capabilities. Uh, they did not put those on display. Uh, they did not want us to know just how good their airplanes were and just how good their pilots were uh, because they wanted to, to be able to catch us by surprise as they did. So this will be my last question and then I'm looking forward to uh, uh, asking the questions that our, the public has. So my last question is the, the vast majority of the casualties in the attack came from one specific incident. Of course, I'm speaking of the Arizona. Now, I bring up the Arizona because it is such a it is such a, an iconic and, and a space where you feel a lot of emotions. Yeah. Now, I know that one of the healing aspects of PTSD is to remember rather than forget the trauma caused by an incident. What does that memorial mean to you? And for example, to you others you have interviewed about Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Well, of course, the Arizona was, uh, I, I think the casual, the K KIA casualties on the Arizona were close to a thousand. So uh, it really did account for an enormous uh, percentage of all of the uh, personnel that we lost in that attack. And that's because the, the uh, magazine went up. Uh, and, um, you know, anyone who studies naval warfare during any era, going back to six frigates, the of wooden ships, the magazine goes up, the ship is finished. Uh, and it's it's exploding from within, and that's what happened to that ship. Um, she sank uh, to the harbor floor, as did uh, four of the other battleships, uh, but uh, was completely destroyed, really keel broken apart. And so while the other ships that were sunk, uh, we were able to raise those ships, maneuver them into dry dock, repair them, California, the West Virginia, the uh, Tennessee, get them back into action by 1943, 1944, where they were actually better ships than they had been before the attack because they'd been comprehensively rebuilt and modernized. Uh, we uh, uh, were never going to be able to do that with the Arizona because of the structural damage to her hull. And, uh, and even raising that ship just to get the wreckage out of there uh, in order to clear that birthing space was going to be an immense job. And uh, so it was decided to leave uh, the remains of that ship where she was, where she is. She's still there today, of course. Uh, as you say, is a memorial that um, many hundreds of thousands of people visit year after year, at least before the pandemic. Uh, and, um, and it is an extraordinary site. Uh, you recognize just how large that ship was, I think almost 30,000 tons. Uh, and, um, and so, yes, I, uh, I know what you mean uh, and uh, have had that, that, um, that feeling myself. Uh, and uh, of course, she did become a, a very important symbol of that attack. Missouri, another battleship, uh, another Im immensely important historical symbol. Uh, which, uh, which today and for all time to come will commemorate those important historical events. So uh, getting to um, the questions from the public and of course, right, right out of the box, we're gonna get to one that we just talked to before we started uh, this. Is it true that the United States had any knowledge of the attack in the days leading up to December 7th? Um, that particular day, whether it was, of course, you know, the controversy that surrounds FDR, Winston Churchill, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in, in short, to the conspiracy theory that our government uh, had foreknowledge that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor, uh, there's just simply no evidence for that. There's no real evidence. I know that there are many who believe it. 
Um, but uh, there is no evidence. And in fact, I don't think it's even plausible uh, that such a conspiracy uh, could be kept uh, at the top of our government. Part of the reason the conspiracy has uh, persisted is because it is true, as we were saying earlier, that by attacking us at Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese uh, solved a tremendous political problem for FDR. And in a sense, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor was, it's hard to say this, but in the long run, I think you might say that it, uh, it benefited uh, our nation and the world by allowing this country to to come into the war in, in a way uh, in which we would very rapidly energize, mobilize, uh, and, uh, and deploy the full resources, formidable resources that we had, and only this nation really could make that kind of a difference. Yeah, so, so if it was a murder case, I think you would say motive. <laughs> they had motive. Well, of course, motive. you know, motive is not is not enough, right, to get a murder conviction. Uh, yeah, so you, you we were talking about this earlier, and you were talking, uh, mentioning that, um, you know, the kind of what ifs, and we talked about some what ifs tonight, is it's that what if um, the Japanese had decided not to attack Pearl Harbor, but instead went after, just simply went after the oil and resources of Malaysia, Indochina, et cetera, et cetera, Borneo, et cetera. Right. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, just recently I was on a, on a panel in New Orleans at the World War War II Museum, in which we discuss some of these counterfactuals regarding Pearl Harbor. And, you know, there's a scenario where they don't attack the United States at all. Uh, and uh, FDR was very concerned about this, uh, that the Japanese would attack the British and would attack the Dutch, but would be uh, scrupulous in avoiding uh, coming into any sort of engagement with any of our forces. So would not touch Guam or the Philippines, any other islands, certainly not Hawaii. Uh, would avoid any sort of air combat, any incidents at sea, uh, but go take uh, Malaya, take Singapore, and then take uh, the Dutch East Indies to get the oil, which is what they needed at that point. Uh, that was what was driving this decision in the first place, was to secure a source of oil, because we had cut off our, our own oil exports. That would have been a tremendous problem, uh, as FDR foresaw, uh, because the isolationist movement would have remained stubbornly committed to staying out of the war. Uh, and uh, it's hard to say what would have happened. I think it's, it's clear that it would have taken longer uh, for the US to get into the war. And uh, we might not have entered it in a, a, a sort of united way that we did. Uh, and you could very easily see a scenario where the war takes much longer uh, for us to win. I think we would have won it in the end, but perhaps it would have taken us another two, three years. Uh, and then there's the possibility, the, the scenario where they attack um, the Philippines, uh, but don't attack. So they do attack us, but they don't attack Pearl, they attack the Philippines. Well, you know, they very quickly would have overrun the Philippines. They did that anyway. Um, and if they had complete surprise uh, without the forewarning of the attack in Hawaii, you can imagine that, that uh, the devastation of the MacArthur's Air Force there would have been even greater than it was. In which case, just as one result of that would be that uh, MacArthur would have been relieved of command without any doubt, just as Kimmel and Short were in Hawaii. And if MacArthur had been relieved of command, you don't have General MacArthur uh, as a factor in the way that we fought the rest of that war. You don't have him as the Supreme Allied Commander in Japan after the war. And you don't have his role in Korea. So th th those are far reaching consequences and that counterfactual as well. Yeah. Yeah, one of these days I'd love to have a discussion with you about MacArthur's impact after the end of the war. So it would be a great topic. Um, but this next question comes from Lisa. Um, and uh, she asks, Mr. Toll, have you ever interviewed any former Japanese military personnel who were involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor? And if yes, what perspective did those interviews give you? You know, I um, have interviewed a number of Japanese veterans. I don't think I ever spoke to anyone who was directly involved in that attack. And, you know, I got involved in researching this subject. It was after Six Frigates was published, so 2007. By that time, uh, most of them had passed. So I personally did uh, not have that opportunity. I have, of course, read just about everything there is available to read. Uh, and um, 
you know, I, I think that uh, the kinds of things that you often heard uh, were that they were very proud of how good they were as a Navy, uh, as an Air Force then. Uh, they were just better than us and they knew it. Um, the uh, uh, way in which that attack un unfolded, I, you know, in general, I, I think the Japanese have not showed a lot of regret for the fact that this was a surprise attack. Uh, they had made a lot of the fact that they had tried to break off negotiations with this 14 point message, not a declaration of war, just a statement that they, they were no longer going to engage in negotiation, negotiations with us, but it was a surprise attack. And, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Japanese in general, I would say, this applies to many of their service personnel as well, really came out of that uh, experience of fighting that war with a real sense of um, a, a sense that war was was evil and futile and that uh, they must never wage it again. The Japanese today are, uh, you know, a, a pacifist people. They have a pacifist clause in their constitution and uh, an anti-war sentiment remains very, very strong there uh, as a result of, of this history. Um, you mentioned media and media is um, kind of looking at the, or, or lack of thereof uh, for looking at the uh, at the Pacific Theater. Um, I got a question here, uh, and that question is: Is how accurate is Torah Torah Torah? Well, Torah 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 is actually a very good film. I think uh, I recently uh, met an American pilot who had um, uh, flown one of the uh, aircraft in the movie. The, it was actually an American trainer aircraft uh, that had been rigged up to look like a Japanese uh, Nakajima Kate torpedo bomber. Um, in general, I, I, having watched the movie about a year ago, I thought the aerial sequences were better than the recent Midway movie. Uh, and I agree. Just, despite the fact that you have all of the filmmaking technology available today, you know, that old fashioned approach of filming real airplanes in flight just seemed to work better. Um, Tora, Tora, Tora uh, was, of course, a joint effort by the American filmmaking industry and the Japanese. It was a fully Japanese cast. Um, the Japanese part of the story was developed by, by Japanese historians and writers. Uh, and so it was admirably accurate in many respects. Uh, it also uh, did um, uh, perpetuate certain myths that we now know are myths, and in particular, the role of uh, uh, Fush uh, Lieutenant Commander Fushida, the uh, leader of the uh, Japanese um, squadron uh, or the uh, air, air um, attack, uh, wrote a, um, a very widely read, very influential memoir that was full of uh, certain kind, certain many different um, uh, myths, including relating to this idea of the third attack, which we were discussing earlier. And so uh, it does involve um, a cert certain amount of mythology. Um, and uh, Admiral Yamamoto, for example, uh, there is no record, no, no documented uh, record to say that he said, we have awoken a sleeping giant. As the actor playing Yamamoto says at the end of that film, that was not said, uh, or at least there, there is no good evidence that he ever said that. That appears to be apocryphal. Um, next question comes from Alan, uh, and we're running, time is running short, so I'm only going to ask two more questions, and actually both of them are from Alan. Um, and first of all, he asks, what piece of criticism against your World War II works do you feel is best situated? What criticism? Well, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of criticisms in mind. Um, I don't believe that my works have been criticized, but I, in general, I would say uh, if I were to look back on it and say, what might I have done differently? I would say uh, I would have liked to probably go a little deeper into the Japanese experience in the first part of the war. Uh, as my trilogy goes on, uh, I go much deeper into the thinking of Japanese leaders in the second and third volume uh, and not as much in the first. Uh, so perhaps I would, that's what I would do differently. And the next question, uh, my last question, um, again from Alan, uh, do you have any plans or ideas for, um, uh, for future scholarship? Uh, I'm a big fan and look forward to your future projects. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, um, there, there is more to say about World War II. And, and um, uh, I would say that there are a few things having to do with the way that we fought the war as a nation uh, that, uh, that, that could use a little more attention. And I think there's some potentially good stories to tell about, for example, uh, the propaganda effort, our effort to reach uh, the Japanese people uh, during the war through our radio broadcasts, our leaflet, leaflets and so forth, the way those messages were developed, the role of Japanese Americans in helping to develop those messages. I think there's a story there. I think there's more to be said about the uh, way that uh, we mobilized for war, the way our uh, government interacted with our industrial sector. I think there are good stories there as well. And, um, and so I potentially see uh, some more books uh, on those subjects. Well, I, at this particular time, uh, to close things out, I would like to introduce the executive director of the Ford, Gerald R. Ford Foundation, Mr. Gleaves Whitney, to close things out. And Gleaves, if you have any final questions for Ian, now's the time to ask. Oh, gosh, I have so many questions. That was a marvelous presentation. I really enjoyed it, engaging the trilogy. I mean, the depth that you go into and the historiographic battles you wade into are just fascinating. And uh, it, it's going to be authoritative for, for many years to come, Ian. And I guess I do have a question. I have a personal connection to uh, Ambassador or Diplomat uh, Saburu Kurusu, and he's the one who delivered the message to FDR. And I was wondering, do you think that he was caught unawares even by his own government that the attack was about to happen? Uh, yes. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the you know, decision to attack us at Pearl Harbor had been a very closely guarded secret. And uh, I, I don't think anybody even in the foreign ministry knew about it, except perhaps the foreign minister, and they didn't let him know until maybe 48 hours before it had happened. So no one, no one in the uh, Washington embassy was aware uh, that, that this was coming. Well, very good. Well, I know we're running out of time. So I just wanna say on behalf of the Ford Presidential Foundation, the Ford Presidential Library and Museum, the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies over at Grand Valley State University, thank you, Ian Toll, for your really powerful presentation to our friends of Ford on this, the 80th anniversary of the date that lives in infamy. Insightful, engaging speakers like Ian are what make the Ford special. If your mind was enriched by this evening's presentation, if your perspective was challenged and perhaps changed, then we hosted a successful program and we hope that you will consider becoming a friend of Ford. To sign up, please visit our website at geraldrfordfoundation.org. There you will find exciting upcoming programs. Let me just mention just one, like this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. We're gonna co-host H.W. Brands with the Howenstein Center and with the library and the museum. He'll be speaking on his most recent book, Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. So we're gonna continue this wartime theme and why war is so uh, uh, engaging in, in, in terms of historical topics. We, want to write about and understand this perennial problem in the human condition that we go to war. So this year at the Ford, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary. The support of viewers like you make it possible for us to continue to offer great programs, we hope, for another 40 years. On behalf of Brooke, Joel, Lauren, and all who helped produce this evening's program, we wish you happy holidays. <laughs>